so good to be together again this evening and grateful again to open up a portion of God's Word tonight that we might again gain insight from our Father and draw closer to Him and gain the wisdom and the strength that He so generously and graciously provides and promises is ours to receive from Him. We'll be open and humble enough to even ask Him, as we talked about this morning, to ask and seek His guidance, and He promises He will give it to us. And we want to focus this evening on just a couple things that come from the book of Proverbs, just three uh, basic simple points that uh, I've always found very encouraging. I've always been so appreciative and also in awe of the wisdom that comes from the book of Proverbs. Uh, it, it truly is uh, the ultimate source of, of insight into just breaking down practical issues of our life. It's so amazing, too, just how, how applicable the Proverbs are. I mean, just about every possible scenario, every crossroads that we could come across, whether we're, we're young people or, or older in life, covers a cross-section of very, very, practically every possible place we're going to uh, be challenged with decision-making. And just filled with this that practical sense of how God would, would guide us and be with us to help us make right choices. And especially from the perspective of a father. Uh, it's amazing, again, how the scriptures kind of change with you. I remember as a young person, uh, it's so weird even saying it, but I guess a younger person. I'm still I'm not that, that, that old, but, but um, uh, just, uh, yeah, just, but I guess maybe younger in the faith uh, to speak more accurately. How much the Proverbs I needed, I felt like I just needed those Proverbs, and it was just amazing how they spoke to certain things I was going through in life. No different now, especially as a father. It's amazing how much insight the Proverbs give to just help us to guide our children, especially because the Proverbs are from that perspective of a father talking to a child and, and, and trusting that uh, if that child would trust this direction of, of the father, then they promise them good things will happen. And so just wanted to kind of just look at some of the things from the Proverbs that open up to us as fathers that can be so helpful and practical. Just three simple points I want to take from the Proverbs here this evening that I think all work together. The Proverbs reveals is kind of a, the, a, good, uh, a good approach uh, that fathers can use and, and hopefully uh, find success in, in, in using them in our lives. But one of the first things that's interesting that comes out of the Proverbs, here this proverb Proverbs 23, verse 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. One of the things the Proverbs kind of speak to is letting the children be a part of your world. It seems like this, so, this was so important from the perspective of the writer of this father in the book of Proverbs. kind of indicates that that's how he's looking at this child. Was letting this child know he wanted to recognize the value of being a part of this person's world. In other words, that it wasn't just this sense of that you need to be, have a sense of responsibility, and yes, that's true, and a sense of obligation, and yes, that's true, and a sense of uh, trusting obedience, and he hits on all these points. But it's so amazing how he kind of taps into the idea that he is really doting on his child. He, he's, he's really... Letting his child know that, that he delights in his child. And so much of that comes out through the Proverbs. Of this idea that he wants this child to know how much he wants that child to be a part of his world. Come and observe my ways. Which is, it's an invitation. In the same way that our father invites us to be a part of his world. It's more than just, I want you to trust my direction. I want you to trust my obedience. I want you to trust that my ways, yes, is they're higher than our ways. And they will be well for us but he wants us to also realize that we can trust him because he has this delight that he loves the idea of opening up himself that we might feel welcome in his presence in fact turn over to jeremiah chapter 9 and jeremiah hits on this point as well the idea of letting letting the children of god or those who who god delights in kind of be a part of his world and how much uh, of that is kind of his focus and even the direction he has for us not just that we would be successful, but that we would understand God, that we would appreciate God, and that he can share his world with us, that we might also uh, fashion our lives after his. And that's kind of, I love that idea of a father who just loves the idea of getting his child to explore his world 
kind of get acclimated with it and the sense of kind of letting him just kind of observe and, and experience that. But notice Jeremiah chapter 9 speaks this. Jeginiah chapter 9 beginning in verse 23. He says, "Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. And notice what's interesting, all three of these things are actually blessings that the Proverbs say are generally kind of re reactions or responses to when we follow the direction of the Father, that we will have wisdom, that we will be strong. And yes, even speaks to the fact that yes, predominantly, if we follow the financial advice and, and the practical advice of how uh, to use our our, our finances in a way that is serving to God. Actually, it's a blessing to us. And he's willing to, uh, to show us the good way in that. And that ultimately it is for our best interest to, yes, enjoy the, the, the physical and the material things of this world. God wants us to enjoy them so long as we are willing to be of service to him in some way. And as he says, so don't boast if, if, if these things are benefits that you have. But notice there's something bigger. There's something bigger that God wants for us than just you have success. I'm glad that you have wisdom. I'm glad that you're strong. I'm glad that maybe you've even found you have financial success and, and, and responsibility has blessed you in life. But he says there's something even more that God wants us to appreciate, and it's the next, the next line. He says, don't boast in these things, but notice verse 24. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. He's a, he has these things because he's a part of my world. He, God loves when children say, no, yes, this is a blessing in my life, but you know how I got this? You know how this came out? Simply because God let me, let me explore his, his world, kind of be a part of his world, a part of his life. And God opened up his wisdom, and God opened up his insight, and God opened up his arms to let me kind of be uh, in fellowship with him. And I love that. He says, boast that you understand God, that you know God, that you have this close relationship with God. And he says, and what is it that we understand about God? He says, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things. In other words, the individual who knows God, they don't boast that I have these things, but they usually use these blessings in service to the Lord because they are such a, uh, great, grateful to be invited in the world of, of the Lord's word, his kingdom, and want to then return that blessing in response to the gratitude of just how God has loved us. And so the Proverbs really speak to that end, and that's how the Proverbs in Solomon and in, in his way as a father speaking to his son saying, that's kind of what I want you to give me your heart. In other words, I, I want you to delight and see the, the blessings that come from this, and hopefully as we as fathers can express that to our children. Let, let our children, kind of the way Jesus was, let the children come unto me. Uh, we need to be more, and it's, I know it's a challenge sometimes. I catch myself sometimes with the idea of I'm, I'm busy right now. Uh, I'm busy right now. And it's so hard. I know sometimes maybe we, 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 and we have noble reasons for why that business is often is, is for the benefit of our children, right? The benefit of those who, we need to be busy. We need to be doing things. But also I have that picture of Jesus, remember, of the children that were, coming to him, and he allowed them to, to, to be present with him, and he put his hands on them, cared for them, blessed them. I think this is a sense, that's what it's speaking of, of let us be open to let our children feel comfortable being just a part of our world, that they know us, and that we want to share that and share those blessings with them. One of the ways we, we can do this, and one of the ways that we can encourage this, is something else that comes from the Proverbs, and it's in Proverbs chapter 3. And there's a specific way that the, the, the father wants his child to understand how he feels about his son. In other words, what would, what would motivate our children to want to accept the invitation? It's one thing to say, well, I'm, you're, you're, you're open to kind of be around me when I'm working in the garage or when I'm, I'm out running errands or when I'm out you know, working in the field or whatever it is that you, as much as you can be around me. But there's something that they need to understand of why that invitation is extended. And I love what Proverbs 3 says about that. Proverbs 3, note in verse 11, he wants his child to understand this. If nothing else, he says, I want you to, I want you to truly embrace this. Proverbs 3 and verse 11, he says, my son, I love that. About, he, he addresses 
She's like, my son. And there's a certain amount of pride in that. There's a certain amount of uh, uh, delight in that. And I love he actually says it. My son. What does he say? Do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. In verse 12, that's what he says. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Let's always make it known and hope we communicate to our children. I think it makes it that balance. That yes, we're, we're disciplining you, we're instructing you, we're correcting you because we delight. You are our delight. And I'll come to says he wants his child to understand that. There's a great example we get from God, the father to his own son. There's a very interesting connection to the resurrection. Remember, it, Jesus himself in many scriptures point that it was God who resurrected Jesus. It was God who poured out all of his power, all of everything that he had to demonstrate all of his might in his son to demonstrate that this was the son in whom he delights. In fact, it goes back to Psalm 2. Go, go to Psalm 2 and notice this is a prophetic statement about how the father looks at his son, Jesus. Psalm 2 and note verse 7. Psalm 2 and verse 7 says... I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Which the father wanted to communicate to his own son Everything that I do, all of my mouth, in fact, all of my attributes are for your benefit. And he delighted in showering the son Jesus with the inheritance, the idea that he would have dominion, that he would uh, have a certain access of power. All of this, and even Jesus points, he says, I'm just, I'm just being the steward of my father's power, my father's world, my father's teaching. But the father always when he said, he communicated to Jesus, you are my son. Well, there was one specific event for all the world to see. In other words, it was public. There's one thing to say for us, yes, in, in private communication to communicate with our children. That we need those private communications. But it's so helpful sometimes when maybe they even kind of that, have that sense of, wow, uh, their dad said this, you know, when other people heard it. Or, or, or dad communicated this, but not just I know it, but he wants other people to know it. God resurrected Jesus. Because he wanted not just Jesus to know, but the whole world to know, this is how much I delight in you. In other words, it was at the expense of all of the power God had, he doted on his son in the resurrection. That's a beautiful thing. That's what this passage is saying. Saying he was his delight to exercise all the power of heaven and give it to his son to demonstrate how much he delighted in him. But go to Acts chapter 13, and that's precisely what the... The apostles, when they were preaching, mentioned about the resurrection. Go to Acts chapter 13 and note in verse 28. Acts chapter 13 and note verse 28. Would you look back, back up to verse 26, get the full context. Acts, Acts, context. Acts 13, 26. He says, brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, to us, the message of this salvation has been sent for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers recognize neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed when they had carried out all that was written concerning him. Notice they took him down from the cross, laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. The very people, uh, the very ones who, who now are his witnesses to the people. It was, it was public. It was manifested. Everybody witnessed it. And notice what, what he gets to this point. Verse 32. 
And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children, that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. In other words, the full acclamation or proclamation of I delight in you, you are my son, is that he gets the full uh, uh, results of God's power that demonstrate it was all for him. I delight in you in such a way, not only that you will know it, but you, everybody's going to witness this. And for all time, everybody recognized, how did Jesus raise from the dead? God raised him up. <laughs> God did it. And I love that. That's a great uh, picture that no doubt that's kind of what Solomon is kind of communicating with his son. Solomon was a great king. Solomon had great wisdom, but what is he expressing to his son? Son, I want you to recognize that I'm putting you in a privileged situation. That I want you to be the beneficiary of all my skill, all of my ability, all that I've learned. I want to pour it into you. And that's really what God was communicating to Jesus. I'm pouring all authority. I'm pouring all power. I'm pouring it into you because you're my son. And so that's something great that we can do. So in other words, yes, invite, invite the children to experience our world, that they might feel comfortable in our presence, that they might, be, uh, they might recognize that we uh, want them to delight in us because we delight in them and have this kind of relationship together. Again, one more time, go to Romans chapter 1. And this is, a set, again, the, the, the inference that Paul makes when he opens up his gospel uh, sermon in Romans chapter 1. But I love the language Paul uses, again, referencing the resurrection. Romans chapter 1, and note verse uh, 16. Or sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 1, sorry, I, I had the wrong verse there. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God. How? With power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So if there was ever any doubt to the world whose father Jesus belonged to, it was in the resurrection. You belong to the most powerful father on earth, and you are my son, and you are therefore the recipient and the beneficiary of all that I am, and I give it to you. And that's in a sense what Solomon is, is really doing to his son, letting him understand that all he's doing is to benefit his son's development and growth. And as we do this, there is a great gift that then we can offer them to hopefully their ears then become open. So as we invite them to become comfortable to exploring our world, to observe us, to see us, that we might then be a blessing to them, to guide them, that their ears might be open, that they might want to listen. How many times, it's interesting, how many times Solomon would emphasize this, son, listen, I want you to listen, that all this is so that his ears might be open. And what he constantly does is encourage his child to understand the amazing blessings that come from listening to the instruction. So we need to have this sense of letting the children delight in us, that they might see that we delight in them, that they might recognize what a delight it is to follow wisdom. It is a delight. It is a blessing. It is for our good. I just want to read a couple of Proverbs that bring this out. One is... Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, perhaps my, my favorite part of Proverbs, where he wants his, his child to make no mistake about what amazing blessings come from listening to God's wisdom and the privilege really it is. It is a privilege. And one of my favorite things as he comes out of Proverbs chapter 3, he says, let me tell you what a privilege it is for us to hear from God. He says, this wisdom that we're talking about, this wisdom that comes from God, he says, it is the same wisdom God used to create the world. He says, that's the wisdom he's giving to you. So he wants to recognize what a privilege and honor it is 
to have ears open that we might hear instruction and guidance of wisdom from God because it is basically he's giving us access to really arrange our world the way God arranged the natural world. How it all fits so well together, right? He did it in just the perfect right away that everything has a natural balance and everything obeys his instruction and his word because there was a wisdom behind it. And notice how he brings this out in Proverbs chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. The privilege of what it is of what this son is about to hear. So start in verse 1. Proverbs 3, verse 1. He says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Would you want to order your life in the most blessed way that pleases not only God, but others recognize what a blessing you are to other, others living in this world? And notice what he says. He says in verse 4 again, he says, You will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Well, in what way can I trust this? Jump over to verse 13. I love what he says here. In verse 13, he says, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding. Her profit is better than the profit of silver. And her gain better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels. And nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways. And all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. And happy are all who holds her fast. Now, look, listen to what he says in verse 19. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps were broken up, and the skies drip with dew. My son, let them not vanish from your sight. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be life to your soul. And adornment to your neck. Then you will walk in your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Notice verse 25. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught, which the practical explanation he's giving to him is he's saying when others might start losing their footing or might losing their confidence or might losing their position and might start wavering and, and doubting and becoming fearful, dreadful, uh, not sure of what direction to go next. He says, what is wisdom able to do for your soul, for your confidence, for uh, your, your, your peace of mind? Well, think of it this way. The God who ordered the entire world, and it stands fast, right? It holds up. There's nothing that shakes this earth, right? Global warming doesn't necessarily, you know, alter <laughs> the, the standing of this world, right? There's going to be the ultimate global warming, yet yeah, one day, and everything's destroyed. You know, contrary to, to the opinion, right, that, that somehow this world is so fragile and so feeble that the slightest, you know, altar is going to just make it crumble. No, it's, it's standing strong. God made it that way. He's saying wisdom will hold us together when the, no doubt, the problems that are in this world threaten our security. The same wisdom that holds the world together will hold you together. Because it's the same principle he used to hold it. In fact, it's a, it's a really a reference to what we see in Colossians chapter 1 of the God who formed and created this earth. He's saying God is wanting to bless you with wisdom in your world. In the world you're living it will hold you together. Notice what he says in Colossians chapter 1. That's what he says about what, what's the final conclusion of the world that God has formed together. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Notice what he says. He says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And well, what's the result of this? That he did it. Verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Wisdom is the practical way that he keeps it together. So think about this. He's saying, isn't it kind of interesting that nothing really shakes this world? It all holds together when all the kingdoms totter and all uh, of the, the ways of life shift and everything seems to tumble. That the world is standing firm. The sun keeps moving. Right? The, 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 it keeps rising and setting day, night. Those things don't change, do they? Seasons come as expected, regardless of who's in charge, what rulers or whatever they want to do. God has ordered the world to stand fast. And he's saying, God has been saying, here you go, here's my wisdom. You keep your world together. <laughs> he says, that's, that's why it's so better than any riches or anything in this world, because it keeps you together. And I love, again, it, it kind of, as the Proverbs go on, it has this tone. Of a father, really, his delight is in his son. His children are open to recognize that they want to explore how this all works. And now that he has this open ear, he's kind of like the thing like, I want to tell you something. Maybe not a lot of people really appreciate or understand how privileged information this is. You are getting access to the wisdom of God that created the world. So we go back there, go back to Proverbs chapter 3. And notice what, what he says. Proverbs chapter 3, notice in verse 26, he says, The Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not devise harm against your neighbor while he lives securely beside you. Do not Contend with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious are an abomination to the Lord. But he is intimate with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked. But he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to the afflicted, the wise will inherit honor, but fools display dishonor. So it's basically just three uh, simple points I wanted to bring out from this amazing book of wisdom and instruction. And number one, he, again, he has the tone of this, is it kind of letting our children feel that they are welcomed into exploring this our world, that they are a welcome presence, they are a delight to us, and we delight in them and express to them how much it is truly an honor for us to call them our children, that, that, that has given us the privilege of fatherhood. And so in other words, this is not a, something that we, we look at as a drudgery, but an honor that we get to take the insight and the wisdom of God that holds the whole world together and get to share it with those who are privileged to, to be in our household. And that's really how God wants us to think of our relationship with him. The privilege it is for us to be in his house. And how he is disclosing to us this privileged information. That really is not given to everybody, but only to those who, again, are, have that desire to want to hear it, to want to understand it, because of how God is expressing it to them. One final passage, but again, this is exactly how Jesus was speaking with his own disciples. One final passage, and we'll get to our invitation Him, But let's end on this note. In John chapter 15, in verse 12. John chapter 15, in verse 12. Notice how Jesus talks to his disciples. He says, This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Words, you've kind of been invited into my world, right? You've experienced how I operate. I, I, I'm, I'm a person of love. I, I teach love. I, I, I express love. I, I have the sole, my, my purpose of everything, whether it's rebuking or disciplining or correction, it's always for love's sake. Notice verse 13. It says, Greater love 
has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. And notice what he says, you are my friends. He expressly communicates who they are to him. You are my friends. And I want you to never forget this and how privileged that is and how I delight in you. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Notice, for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. That's a relationship that's something we can help with our children recognize. Do you realize this is privileged information? This information might be rejected by the world, but how privileged you are when you are open to hearing it. And hopefully as they see how we operate, see how we order our lives to us, realize what a privilege it is for children to have fathers who are seeking to share that, express that, that they might be a delight, that they might grow. And listen, that's exactly what Jesus says. I want to just finish on the last two verses, verse 16. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command that you love one another. Which I'm communicating all this, I'm doing all this, that you might receive the ultimate blessings from God. And what a blessing fathers can be to communicate that with our own children. Recognize this is a privileged opportunity to gain privileged access to the wisdom of God. If anyone is with us who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we want to let you understand how privileged God wants you to feel. As he just said through his own son, Jesus lays down his life for those he wants to be his friends. He wants to have a special, unique relationship with you. That's one of privilege and honor. In other words, just as we talked about, he wants you to be actually be invited to explore his world. He's opening it up to you. The whole host of heaven is open for you to explore, to be a part of. He says, I want you to be at home with me in the kingdom. And what is the blessing of that? That he delights in us. He's already demonstrated how he delights us. He died for us. That we, again, that we might be open, that we might hear his instruction, that we might follow him in death as well, that we might die to the things that are, we are connected to so, so closely in this world, that we might let go of those things and give ourselves wholly to God. That we might be forgiven of our sins through baptism, that he delights in preaching the gospel, of being that gospel picture for us, that through his death, burial, and resurrection, if we die and are buried in baptism and rise again to walk in newness of life, just as the Proverbs say, we reap the benefits. The benefits are eternal and far supreme of anything this world can offer, better than silver and gold, because we get the access of what the creator of all the world and what his power has access to he wants to dote that on us just as he expressed in his son think about this he expressed all his power and all his ability and his son who he delights we get to become fellow joint heirs with christ we become children of god just as jesus is the son you are the children of god through jesus that he wants to delight in you as he did in jesus so what blessings are ours if we accept that invitation, humble ourselves and come to God. If you need to be baptized, we encourage you to do that, that you would submit to the uh, credentials and, and conditions of salvation to be baptized, Mark 16. 16, he, was, he believes is baptized will be saved. But if you've already done that, perhaps have veered away from the safety and the wisdom and the instruction of the Father and have fallen into the pitfalls and the consequences of sin, there's an opportunity for you to come back, that Father's always willing. And always calls us to come back to him, to be in the safety of the house. Won't you, whatever your condition is, won't you come to the Lord, be safe with him, be forgiven of sin, and be right with him while we stand.